In this session, we're looking at uh, the second, the second part of the Middle Ages from like 800 to 1200. I want to start off with thinking about what society was like then, some developments that I think are important for uh, contextualizing our discussion before moving on to uh, missions. Not as much uh, to say about uh, missions in this part, uh, though some significant things. Uh, we'll see a gradual transition in the next sections uh, as more and more missionary activity is done uh, to other uh, places, but still quite a bit of mission work done. But, but first, let's stay, set the stage uh, a little bit. Um, in thinking about where we left off, we left off um, from a political standpoint, uh, thinking about Charlemagne. Uh, the Charlemagne is uh, the Frankish, the king of the Franks, uh, and so he is uh, consolidating his power in the Frankish kingdom, etc. But on Christmas Day in the year 800, uh, Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne as emperor. <coughs> And um, this is, you know, really the first emperor in the West uh, for several hundred years. Uh, now, Charlemagne has a tense relationship with the Pope uh, throughout all of this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things that uh, Leo is accused of doing, uh, accused of adultery, other things. Uh, so there's some tense relationships between the two. And in the East, um, you know, there there is a kind of a power vacuum. So there's this question in the East about what Charlemagne represents, uh, how that's going to relate to uh, some things that are going on in um, in the East as well with their uh, power issues. But the crowning of Charlemagne suggests some things. First, it suggests that there is a unity in Western Christianity. Uh, you know, the, the, the West is unified. Uh, and it also suggests, you know, they're trying to make this continuation with the Roman Empire. Empire. And it's kind of digging that deep into those roots. Um, on the other hand, of course, it's kind of this rejection of any Eastern emperors. But and finally, there is this suggestion, the fact that it is Leo who crowns Charlemagne, that the Pope is over kings. Now, on the other hand, to Charlemagne, you know, the fact that he has been anointed and the fact that a lot of people talk about his reign being like David, King David, and King Josiah, um, suggests to him that he has religious responsibilities as well. And so he doesn't like the notion of being subservient to the, to the Pope. Instead, uh, he thinks that uh, he should lead the church also. And he's controlling most of the West, uh, except for places controlled by Muslims and the British Isles. Uh, so he has wide expanse of political power. And so he turns that into leading an ecclesiastical power as well, where he uh, appoints bishops instead of allowing the Pope to have that authority. Uh, he legislates how preaching is to be done, what languages preaching should be taking place in, uh, what is to be preached. Um, that he he collects the tithes, the, the offerings of people as if they were taxes. Um, so you know it's it's like it's a governmental responsibility to collect the contribution, uh, and he really comes down on this uh, celibacy of uh, the clergy and other religious positions. Now, at this point, though, there's not a strong um, you know, empire. Uh, any sort of empire that Charlemagne is considered uh, leading breaks down uh, after his death. Just to kind of give you some ideas, this, is, this isn't something that necessarily uh, expects you to get or would, wouldn't appear on an exam, but so when Charlemagne dies, his son, Louis the Pious, uh, and there's a lot of nicknames for these people. Uh, so Louis the Pious becomes the ruler. And Charlemagne, as he's getting ready to die, realizes that this is the case. And so, um, you know, he basically encourages Louis to crown himself. Don't let the Pope crown you. Which he did, but later he would also let the Pope cry, crown him, um, you know, because he's Louis the Pious. 
And so he uh, he really is connected with the church. Um, Lewis would make an arrangement with his son Lothair uh, to become co-emperor, and with that there is a there's a relationship that is made with the Pope that kind of allows some balance here, right? The emperor has supreme jurisdiction in political matters, but the pope has power over the uh, papal states. Uh, and there's guidelines developed as to uh, how the pope was to be elected. Um, the emperor had to confirm the election. The pope had to take a loyalty oath to the emperor, but the pope crowned and anointed the emperor. Um, well, Lewis is pretty good-natured, and a variety of people take advantage of this. And so the later part of his reign is marked by civil wars, uh, some of which come from his sons, including Lothair, uh, Louis the German, Pippin, Charles the Bald. I told you these were some weird names. Um, and so he would defeat these groups, and then he would forgive them, and then later they rebel, and so there's all sorts of problems. Um, after Louis the Pious dies, his uh, sons divide the emperor, empire. So again, the breakdown of this empire. Um, his grandson, Louis's grandson, Charles the Fat, uh, would become emperor toward the end of the 9th century, uh, reunite the empire, but after his death, it would break up again. So there's a lot of political instability, uncertainty, uh, and all of that is uh, a part of, of this. Uh, in addition, there are new invasions taking place. Um, and so there's additional struggles that are from outside some of these empires, uh, like the Norsemen, uh, Scandinavians. Uh, the Germanic peoples from Scandinavia, uh, they it invaded extreme northern Europe, um, but eventually developed shipbuilding, uh, which allows them to travel and attack more regions. Right? The, the people we're talking about are the, the Vikings. Um, Vikings, uh, as they begin, are largely pagan. Uh, they invade Ireland in the 8th century. They ravage the monasteries there. Uh, they attack the coasts of what will become France and sack the churches and the monasteries there, uh, take uh, property, take slave, people as slaves. Um, they're seen as enemies of God because they're, they're attacking churches. Um, but gradually, they become Christian. They, they kind of take the faith of those they've conquered. Uh, and largely, too, you see this kind of, um, you know, they... they um, the leaders become Christians, and so the leaders kind of coerce their followers into becoming Christians as well. Another set of invasions come from the east. Uh, they, the people are Magyars, but they are reminiscent of the Huns, and so they become known as Hungarians. Uh, they repeatedly invade what is today Germany um, and travel into southern Italy. They are converted through mission activity, so this is the reason that they become uh, Christian is uh, mission work, and uh, through that, um, by the 10th century, late in the 10th century, uh, their king was baptized, and uh, the next king forced all of his people to convert. So there's new invasions, uh, there's the instability, there's transitions in power, particularly that, you know, this empire, this imperial power, moves from being under the control of the Franks to being under the control of the Saxons. So the death of Charles the Fat essentially ends the, this revived Roman Empire. And so it devolves into kind of a variety of territories ruled by various kings. The last of the Carolingian kings, the people connected with Charles Martel, uh, the last of these kings was Louis the Lazy. All right, Louis the Lazy, uh, who dies childless. Well, meanwhile, in Germany, the, ruler, uh, the rulers of Saxony, a region of Saxony, begin to rise in prominence. And so Henry the Fowler, uh, Fowler as in, you know, he's birds, he's using birds uh, for hunting and things like that. He's elected king of, uh, you know, what would become Germany in 919. Uh, he's the first Saxon king over the region. So he makes plans for his son, 
Otto to succeed him, uh, which he does in 936 uh, after Henry dies from a stroke. Now, not everyone is happy uh, about this, including Otto's brother, so there's revolt and rebellion, and Otto gradually consolidates his power. And in his consolidation, he's claiming uh, that he is, uh, he has a divine right to rule over these people, including uh, the ability to appoint bishops and other church leaders. Uh, now, on the other hand, um, you know, he tries to uh, take some power from secular rulers and give it to the church officials in order to tie those church officials more closely to him. So he begins to consolidate his power, extend his control beyond Germany into Italy, uh, you know, the places that are undergoing uh, political turmoil. Um, the Hungarian revolts take place, or uh, incursions take place. Um, you know, eventually Otto is successful against them. And because of his prominence, he arranges for the Pope, John XII, to have him crowned emperor in 962, becoming uh, Otto I. He's crowned over, as king over the kingdom of Italy as well as Germany. And this area will later become known uh, as the, the Holy, Holy Roman Empire, uh, which lasted a long time. Um, he lasted at least in name uh, until the 1800s, almost the 1800s. Um, Otto's son, Otto II, uh, will become Roman emperor, uh, which will uh, anger the, uh, the, the Byzantines. Uh, because they believe that they, their emperor is the Roman emperor. Um, Otto II expected uh, bishops, even the pope, to obey him. Um, Otto I expected bishops, even the pope, to obey him. He uh, deposed anybody that disagreed with him, including Pope John XII, uh, who, after he crowns, after he crowns Otto I, um, begins to fear the power that he has. So Otto I dies, Otto II. Otto II dies, um, and his son, Otto III, is only three years old. So he's now emperor at three years old. Uh, and so there's a lot of um, power struggles until Otto III is old enough to rule. Um, and so there's uh, all that that goes on. Um, and eventually... Um, his uh, Otto III's cousin Henry becomes emperor when Otto dies very young. Henry dies childless without a successor, uh, and the uh, the dukes and the nobles uh, decide to elect the king from a different region than Saxony. And so Otto II becomes emperor, but he dies without a successor. So rule will pass from the, Fran uh, the Saxons to the Franconians. It's a region in modern Germany. Uh, they come to power in the 11th century, um, and the, the next emperor, Henry III, will refer to himself as the king of the Romans rather than as the king of the Germans. Um, they, too, had the idea that there should be you know, this imperial power uh, that uh, includes you know, deciding the papacy, uh, making decisions about a variety of religious matters. Um, Henry III, for example, will remove three popes and put his own people in power, uh, you know, the people that he wants to sit on the throne. Well, during this time, um, you know, there is a lot of tension between the pope and various emperors. Sometimes that's emperors in the West, and sometimes that's emperors in the East. And a lot of it is over power. Who can make political decisions? Who has the ultimate authority? Um, you know, who's over this person? Is the Pope the uh, supreme authority? Is the emperor supreme authority? Who can make what decisions? And a lot of this is reflected in what becomes known as the investiture controversy. This is over who has the right to install or ordain individuals to religious office. 
And throughout the Middle Ages, there had been uh, a lot of differences. Nobility in various places thought they had that right. Um, the Pope uh, thought that he had that right. Um, a lot of this has to do with the amount of land that bishops control. Um, and so they're actually like lords of the empire. They are nobles in the empire, uh, in addition to be religious leaders. On the other hand, of course, um, this makes the office of bishop open for sale. And ultimately, um, various popes uh, attempt to try and um, you know, hold control at least over this religious office, even though it has a lot of political consequences as well. But, you know, they, uh, <clears throat> the popes sometimes don't really have a lot of moral authority through the later Middle Ages. Um, you know, the, the, often there was a lot of immorality in there as well, because there are uh, efforts by a variety of people to try and either gain the papacy or uh, become uh, pope themselves, or, or control the people in the papacy. Um, yeah, and this is evidenced in uh, you know these these attempts to try and gain political power um, in what are known as the false or pseudo Isidorian decretals. Uh, you know these statements that are supposedly um, documents from an older individual giving the pope certain power. Um, you know, these are supposedly from early popes, early uh, councils, but by the 11th century they become really important that said, um, <clears throat> you know, these early bishops uh, did things this way and so we need to change our structures and our, our powers. Um, and so it's an attempt to gain uh, the control over the bishops back for the pope as opposed to the emperor. Um, they're eventually shown to be forgeries, but it does reflect that there's a lot of power struggle going on in the Roman Empire over religious matters. There's also, uh, you know, the issue of the archbishops, the development of uh, a group that was over the bishops, um, you know, that uh, there's a concern uh, that they are growing in power as well. Now, archbishops used to refer to representatives of popes, but uh, in the Middle Ages it becomes, you know, people that are bishops of important places. Um, and so there's this concern about, do they have too much authority? And so the pope tries to give more authority to the bishops to downplay the authority of the archbishops. All right, so it's all this power struggle that's going on. Um, and then there's, you know, the, the moral decay in the papacy itself. Um, pope w popes were murdered. Um, popes were, um, you know, popes um, were removed from office. Uh, so, for example, um, Pope John VIII reigned from 872 to 882 uh, before he was murder murdered. Uh, over the next nine years, there are three different popes. So there's unrest all over, not just in Rome because of this. Uh, popes were strangled, they were starved, sometimes there were moral, or there were a variety of claimants to the throne of being pope. Um, in 864, a man named Formosus becomes uh, pope, and he becomes pope, you know, he schemed to become pope, his enemies disappeared. Um, and he was just, uh, you know, very concerned about, um, you know, securing the papacy, keeping on to the papacy. A horrible uh, rule as as pope. Um, so much so that after death, and we, I think we talked about this in survey of church history. After death, his body is taken out of his grave. It's exhumed and put on trial. Now, this is known as the Cadaveric Council. Uh, in 897, and he's condemned of all sorts of crimes, he's found guilty, his body's drugged through Rome, thrown in the Tiber River, um, you know, so there's, there's examples of, of that, uh, there's the actions of uh, Theodora, who's the wife of a, sen a senator, and Morosia, her daughter, uh, Morosia becomes the concubine 
of a pope, and becomes a concubine of a pope at the age of 15. They will have a son. Uh, Theodora has her lover, not her husband, her lover, uh, made pope. He becomes John the Tenth. Um, you know, later on, Morosia will have John the Tenth deposed, perhaps murdered. Uh, she will arrange uh, for the next pope, Leo the Sixth, to become pope. Um, when you know, there's death. Uh, there's the the illegitimate son of uh, Morosia and, and Pope Sergius becomes John the Eleventh. Um, Four of the later popes through the first half of the 11th century were descendants of Morosia. Uh, so, you know, I mean, these two women had such a great uh, influence, and it's not necessarily the problem here being their women, but the, the moral quality of these women in affecting an office that theoretically uh, should be one of high morals, uh, strong leadership, uh, yet is one that is open to such. Um, immorality. Uh, a good example of uh, the height of this is the example of John the Twelfth. Uh, John the Twelfth uh, was born Octavian. He is the son of Alberic II. Uh, Alberic II is the son of Morosia. So Octavian is Morosia's grandson. So Alberic II manages to make sure that the next time there's need for a pope, Octavian would be elected. He is. Uh, he's 18, somewhere between 18 and 20, when he becomes pope and takes the papal name John the Twelfth. Uh, this is the pope that will crown Otto the First as the Holy Roman Emperor, but he lived a, well, one uh, commentator referred to it as lived a devil's life. Totally unscrupulous, he would hold these drunken orgies. He evidently had a harem. Um, you know, he's, he's not the kind of person that you would want being the leader of, uh, of Christianity uh, in, in Western Europe. Uh, Otto, for example, is going on a military cam campaign in, in 962 and warns John XII that he needs to change his ways. And so um, he goes off to his military campaign. John starts trying to make a variety of allies against Otto. So he's working against, conspiring against Otto. Otto finds out about it, has a, a calls a council, deposes John the Twelfth. Um, Pope Leo the Eighth is put into power. But once Otto leaves Rome, John returns with an army that causes Pope Leo the Eighth to flee. He has himself reinstated. He becomes ruler of Rome again, um, ultimately dying during an adulterous encounter. Uh, it's not clear how he died. Was it a discovered lover? Did he have some sort of physical condition that happened? Um, you know, it's not clear. Um, so all sorts of things taking place. Emperors deposing popes, putting new popes in place, trying to decide who was the true pope amongst a variety of rivals. Uh, the example of Benedict the Ninth is also instructive here. Uh, the son of Albrecht the Third, the great grandson of Morosia, he becomes pope three times in the middle of the 11th century. Um, he becomes pope for the first time at the age of 20 uh, in the year 1032. Uh, there's some older sources that say he was only 11 or 12 when he became pope. Um, he had a scandalous life, very few qualifications related to the pap papacy. Um, he's there was alleged alleged uh, rape, uh, alleged rapist, um, alleged murderer. May also have been homosexual. Um, he's forced out of the papacy in 1036, so four years after he's appointed pope. But he gains the emperor's help to return. He's forced out again in 1044, and a new pope is put in his place. Uh, he gains some additional support in 1045 and takes over again. He considers uh, abdication because he wants to marry, um, and so he essentially sells his papacy to his grandfather, uh, John Gratian, uh, who thinks Benedict is unworthy of being pope, and so he has no problems with you know, getting Benedict out of there. Uh, Gratian becomes Gregory VI, um, 
he's just been, um, you know, I mean, Benedict had just come back, and now he's leaving again. Um, and so Benedict kind of regrets his abdication, wants to come back, um, you know, and there's this back and forth, Benedict claiming the throne, Gregory claiming to be the rightful pope, uh, Pope Sylvester, who had taken over in 1044, claims he should be the pope. Uh, finally, Henry III gets involved. And so Benedict and Sylvester are deposed, leaving Gregory VI, but the bishops encourage Gregory to resign, uh, and Clement II is selected as pope. Uh, when Clement II dies, Benedict attempts to seize the papacy again, but he is driven out by German troops, uh, and ultimately Benedict ends up uh, excommunicated. So, you know, there's all sorts of places here where moral reform is really needed. And in that, you know, there are a variety of people who want to see and try to make efforts to bring about reform. And a lot of the reform, if you remember from a survey of church history, comes from the monastic houses. It's the monks who want to see reform. Uh, and the, the monastery, particularly in Cluny, France, uh, is the first of these major reformers here in the later Middle Ages. Essentially, uh, you know, the idea behind here is uh, to try and reestablish some discipline and some practices done by older monks. And so they're seeking to establish older forms of monasticism and, you know, wanting to be separate from the society and the decay. And, and they are able to get some uh, uh, help from a variety of religious uh, political leaders to make sure that happens. As the monastery at Cluny developed, um, others started to want to practice this as well. And so there are two types of houses that develop uh, related to the, the Cluny monastery. Some are daughter houses that submit to the leadership of Cluny. They, they don't have local leadership. They submit all their leadership decisions to the Cluny monastery. Uh, others are monasteries that follow Cluny but have their own leadership. Right? So you have some that are directly connected to Cluny and some that are just following the Cluniac pattern. A couple things about uh, the Cluniac monasteries. Um, you know, they were considered themselves very independent, both from uh, a standpoint of selecting their own leadership, right, the Cluny monasteries and, and some of the, the non-daughter houses, also managed to get independence from having to pay uh, taxes for the bishop's oversight, or ta taxes, as well as uh, freedom from the bishop's oversight, freedom from the control of Rome, um, which allowed for, uh, you know, encouraging certain things like um, that priests and bishops should uh, live under a monastic rule. So a lot of these monks will eventually become priests and bishops as well, uh, and, and wanting to um, have them exhibit some of the discipline of monasticism uh, when they get into these positions. Uh, less emphasis on manual labor, like there had been in other monasteries, and so that people could focus on worship, um, so they could focus on learning, and, and some other things that uh, they thought were more important. Uh, the plan was to focus on prayer, uh, engage in silence, uh, and, you know, ultimately it does have a, an impact. Um, and there are a couple of places where the, the Cluniac monasteries have an impact. One is the development of reform. Uh, these, these Cluny uh, uh, monks become bishops, they become pope. Uh, they encourage a development of peace as well as, you know, trying to change some things in, in combat, rules of combat. Uh, the peace of God uh, referred to ideas about protecting certain classes of people, non-combatants, uh, people that couldn't defend themselves, 
uh, trying to develop wars, rules of warfare that protected church buildings and priests uh, and, and other types of, of groups. Uh, the truce of God had to do with uh, private conflicts and when they could be done, when they couldn't be done, um, to try and, again, protect certain classes of, of people. Cluny was also very important in promoting clerical celibacy, uh, heavy emphasis uh, on that, and you know, trying to bring about reform related to simony. Remember, simony refers to this idea of buying and selling church offices named after Simon the, the sorcerer. So the Cluny Monastery um, was very important in bringing about these uh, reforms uh, in the monasteries, but then it has a larger uh, impact. And, and some of that happens as Cluny uh, monks become bishops and pope. Uh, there's the example of Bruno of Toul, uh, who becomes Pope Leo IX. Uh, you know, he had um, wanted to, uh, you know, he kind of experiences some of these ideas of reform, uh, becomes bishop, becomes pope, uh, wants to see things ending in the church like simony, and he wants to see the encouragement of the universal practice of clerical celibacy, and pushes for other things related to the reforms within the monasteries, reforms of uh, the bishops and their, their luxurious lives, wanting to see people being more charitable, which, um, you know, he has some success in reform, like in what would be modern-day Germany, but it's slow starting in France, um, you know, and, and so there's, there's some success, some not. There's a lot of things that uh, Leo is working against um, but he's, he's making some success, and he does demonstrate these efforts by people to bring about reform, to make changes they thought were necessary. Um, by the 12th century, however, the Cluniac system started to decline. A lot of people begin to believe that Cluny and similar houses are compromising their ideals, they're gaining too much wealth. You know, I mean, the idea, of course, is you create this monastery, but the monastery begins to attract others, and so you've got these villages and towns around them, and that brings the monks more and more involved in society, and so that brings with it, you know, a, a certain level of wealth. And so there is, again, this attempt to say we need to return to this separate lifestyle. Um, and so there were some people who developed a new monastery in Citeaux, France. They become known as Citercians. Um, and so they start a new monastery, new buildings. They go back to farming with the idea of we're going to go back to some of these uh, reforms. Uh, so there's this rejection of wealth you know, and the trappings of wealth. Uh, there shouldn't be any silver crosses or gold crosses, everything should, you know, the crosses should be made of wood. The liturgy, the, the amount of time spent in public worship or communal worship uh, in saying of prayers and what prayers are said, uh, there's an effort to kind of simplify that so that more people could uh, spend time contemplating, uh, meditating. Uh, and then there's also this desire to, you know, create these self-sufficient monasteries, things that would be separate. Um, you know, build these monasteries in secluded areas, and everything that is needed is, you know, taken care of by the monks or maybe a few servants of the monastery, but largely self-sufficient. Um, the Cistercian order spreads throughout Western Europe into places like England, uh, Germany, Italy, uh, Poland in the in the east, Norway, Spain, Portugal. Um, but it began begins uh, declining as well in the 1200s due to some other types of monastic living um, that take place. Uh, same kind of things: the relaxation of the rules. Wealth begins to develop, uh, the monks get away from manual labor, etc. Uh, there's still some Sertertian monasteries around uh, even today. Let's turn then to thinking about 
missions and some of the things related to missions in this later period. Um, in many cases, the conversions that take place in this time period um, parallel a lot of the things that we saw with Clovis uh, and that we've highlighted in other examples where a person has an experience of Christianity's power either through conquering armies or through apparent supernatural events uh, or, you know, answers to prayers, etc. And so here's this leader that has this experience that leads to a conversion and then the leadership, uh, the leader's conversion often results in this mass conversion um, by other people. Additionally, the uh, Nestorian church uh, is still active. We won't spend as much time talking about it because we highlighted some things uh, there in the last session. Um, and so it continues to spread, but as Islam expands uh, into this time period, the Nestorian church begins to, uh, the, the success of the Nestorian church begins to decline. Let's look then at a couple of uh, examples of mission work at this time. Uh, we'll start in Europe uh, and the region now known as Germany. Uh, example of this is the life of Boniface. Um, Boniface was born in England sometime around the late 7th century. And he would become very active in missions to the European continent, um, and particularly what is now known as Germany, um, is commissioned by the Pope to be a missionary bishop to Germany. Uh, and in his efforts in Germany and a few other places, he's very effective in not only converting people, but then encouraging people to evangelize. All right? So it's the same kind of mindset of um, <clears throat> training converts for further mission work. Now, for Boniface, uh, you know, while he's not specifically focusing on a leader, he does tend to fo focus on the upper classes, believing that if the upper classes are converted, the people of the lower classes will follow them, and that will lead to these mass conversions. What's also concerning for Boniface is you know, he's going to these regions where there should be Christians, or there are people that are Christians, but they are apparently Christians in name only. They've kind of gone back to pagan practices. And so that's deeply concerning to Boniface uh, because of, uh, you, know, his, you know, he wants to see that there should be this, uh, this, these standards, these expectations. And so he, you know, makes great effort to try and bring these paganized Christians back to Orthodox Christianity. Uh, here's one example of his efforts to return them to the fold. And it's essentially this idea of what's known as the power encounter. Um, and so you, you'll see this phrase in Pearson and a couple other uh, textbooks uh, related to missions about the power encounter. Essentially, this idea of, it's kind of like Elijah on Mount Carmel is the way one uh, scholar kind of uh, explains it, right? Where you have uh, the representative of God going against the representatives of the false god, with God ultimately triumphing, uh, and that's something what we see here with Boniface. So uh, he's in the region of Germany. He gathers a large crowd uh, together at one of the sacred oaks of the Thunder God, and so they're there. He's there. He starts chopping down this oak tree. Right, the oak tree that belongs to the sacred god or is, is, is representative of the sacred god. And so there's, you know, whoa, what's he doing? And nothing happens to him. Right? The tree is chopped down, um, and here he is still standing. Right? The thunder god has not done anything to him. So, you know, that, of course, is suggestive to the people that are there. Uh, and so his fame begins to grow through the region of, you know, he'd taken on the gods and survived. So maybe we should listen to him. Maybe he's a person that has some power. Uh, and becomes a, he becomes a subject of a variety of legends. One of those, for example, is that when he chopped down the tree, the, the pieces that come off, uh, you know, that it's, it's chopped, it breaks into four pieces, and as it falls, it's kind of in the shape of a cross. 
kind of. So, you know, again, a lot of these stories coming out about Boniface. Uh, he would go to other, well, out of that event, evidently there were uh, quite a few baptisms. Um, he would go to other pagan places and do similar things. Um, but after a while, he is concerned that such a, an aggressive effort of taking on the pagan gods is not going to bring about long-lasting Christianity. Uh, and so he begins to soften his uh, approach uh, as well. Uh, and he actually goes the mission monasteries route. Right, kind of like Patrick and some other people we saw in England, um, and you know, so starting these monasteries, um, bringing people in, preparing them for ministry, etc. Uh, he also becomes very active in recruiting women to be missionaries, uh, which had not been done for a long time uh, by this point. Right, this is not you know, there's a lot of women involved in missionary work in the New Testament and shortly after, but. That kind of dies off as far as like efforts to recruit women to do this, but Boniface is one that uh, is active in in that regard. Another region uh, where we see Christian missions at this time is in Moravia. Uh, there's a region kind of between uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe, kind of now where the Czech Republic is. Um, it had been invaded by Western forces, and so they appeal to Constant Constantinople. But their appeal is for missionaries, not army, missionaries. But the idea being uh, that they're concerned, the leaders are concerned that the Catholic influence from these Western uh, invaders is going to lead to a decline in Orthodox Christianity. And so the patriarch of Constant, excuse me, yeah, the uh, emperor of Constantinople sends two brothers, Cyril and Methodius, uh, to Moravia. Uh, they are sons of a military officer. Cyril had been an educator. Uh, Methodius had worked as a civil servant. Um, they had done mission work as well before. Uh, Cyril had been involved in some missions to Muslims. Uh, Methodius, uh, well then he had been involved in some missions to Muslims uh, and then gone on to do work in Russia or with Russians and uh, Methodius had been involved in um, the Russian work as well. Uh, so Emperor Michael III of Constantinople sends them to Slavic regions of Central Europe um, and they encounter something like what we saw with Ufalos, which was uh, we want them to we want these people to have a copy of the Bible, but they don't have a written language. So Cyril creates an alphabet now known as Cyrillic uh, to write the Gospels in the Slavic language. There are conflicts uh, between uh, Cyril and Methodius and the um, the Catholics there. Um, so the uh, brothers journey to Rome and come back with, or, or go to Rome and get a papal endorsement, uh, which is meant to try and uh, kind of free them up some. Uh, Cyril will die before they return, uh, and Methodius will kind of continue on the work. Uh, he continues the translation of the Bible, uh, translates other uh, literature into Slavic, um, and you know he still faces some of this, uh, these, these struggles. Uh, their work uh, had political consequences as well as religious ones. It led to a unified Slavic identity. There really wasn't a Slavic identity um, until there is kind of this Slavic written language, a Bible, literature, right? So you, you have these brothers organizing this church around a racial or an ethnic line, and uh, that becomes kind of the standard way that a lot of Orthodox Christians operate. And so that's why you have, like, Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox and Armenian Orthodox, uh, you know, around these nationalistic or ethnic lines. It's, you know, this is kind of uh, mission work. Which, you know, also means that there's a looser unity to Orthodox Christianity than, like, there is in Catholicism. Because within Catholicism, everything was to be done in Latin, right? The liturgy, the prayers, the 
the homily, anything done in a worship service was in Latin. But within Orthodox Christianity, it was, you know, whatever the, the local language was, um, you know, Slavic or, or Greek or Russian. Speaking of Russian, uh, let's look a little bit at some things going on in Russia. Um, during the ninth century, um, there are, uh, you know, again, you know, that, that mission work to the Slavs, but also to Russians. Um, and so Christianity, uh, Orthodox Christianity, expands into Eastern Europe as well as Northern Asia, kind of going two different directions. Um, again, there's differences in customs, but unity in doctrine, where the Catholic practice is unity in language, customs, and doctrine. One important connection is the connection between Constantinople and Kiev. And so this relationship develops between these two cities, uh, which allowed traders uh, from Kiev and what's now Russia to connect with Orthodox Christianity that they then brought home. So the, it's kind of a kind of economic uh, development uh, precedes a missionary development. Uh, eventually, though, a bishop moves to Russia uh, and begins to have some success in conversion. But in the later part of the ninth century, um, persecution leads to Christianity just about disappearing. So there's, there's a little bit of success, but nothing that seems to be lasting. However, in the middle of the 10th century, uh, Princess Olga is converted. And so out of this conversion, she believes that it's important to bring Christianity back to Russia. Uh, apparently, you know, she's, she's, religiously, in, in, you know, practicing the indigenous religions uh, of the area, and uh, after her conversion, well, no, uh, she hears about the lies of Christians, uh, certain Christians, and that's really kind of intriguing to her. And so she begins to uh, study with uh, several teachers, decides to become baptized, and then travels to Constantinople to learn more. So, Olga is bringing about this attempt to try and bring back uh, Constantinople, or not Constantinople, to bring back Orthodoxy. Um, however, when her son takes over, um, you know, he appears to have stayed on the pagan course and Orthodox Christianity uh, begins to decline. It's not completely disappearing like it had before, but it begins to uh, decline. However, uh, Olga's grandson turns to Orthodox Christianity and t turns to his grandmother's faith. Uh, he'll later be known as Vladimir, um, and had started off uh, as a strong military leader, lived a really immoral life uh, in his early adulthood, participated in paganism, um, had his brother killed in order to take control of Kiev, um, supposedly also killed the first Russian martyrs uh, as part of a human sacrifice that he had promised the pagan gods for victory in battle. Uh, so, you know, his early life, very, very pagan, very immoral. Um, there are a variety of traditions about how he became Christian. Some say that he investigated a variety of religions. And he's just interested in trying to find the right religion, and he investigated religions including uh, Judaism and Islam and others. Um, there's another legend that he was blind, binded by Paul, binded like Paul, not by Paul, like Paul, and uh, healed uh, after his baptism. Um, but again, you know, it's unclear, but he does at some point decide to be baptized and become Christian. And like with other groups, it appears that, you know, there's this mass baptism that takes place. Um, it appears that Vladimir essentially tries to, you know, orders the people to be baptized. Well, as Vladimir continues to, continues to expand his control, orthodoxy uh, expands as well. There's a connection to Constantinople, strong connection there, but it's also becoming a Russian orthodoxy. 
Um, when Vladimir died and his son took power, uh, his son continues to uh, expand orthodoxy. Um, much of the leadership of the church at this time is Greek Orthodox, um, but often the bishops that come from Constantinople um, don't remain there long. Uh, you know, if they're, especially if they're used to Constantinople. Uh, evidently, it was tough with the re relocation. Uh, there's difficulties of language, obviously. Um, there are still persecution in other areas of Russia, um, places that were not under the control of Vladimir or his sons. But uh, there is some gradual conversion of uh, many of these groups, some of which were pagan and some were Muslim. Um, and so it, it doesn't seem, though, uh, like there was a substantial conversion of the entirety of Russia. Right? This is the city of Kiev and a couple of areas controlled uh, by the city of Kiev and the leaders. And, and so there seems to be um, you know, places where orthodoxy is spreading. There were some um, Catholics in Russia, but not many, uh, predominantly an orthodox form of Christianity. However, uh, through the first part of the 1200s, uh, Mongols uh, first under Genghis Khan, and then his descendants begin invading Russia. Uh, wealth was plundered from places, churches and monasteries were burned, church books were lost, um, clergy were participating in the fighting and were executed or taken as slaves, uh, so that had a significant impact on Orthodox Christianity as well. Um, Orthodox Christians were allowed to continue to practice uh, but within two decades after this, after the fall of Kiev, the leader of the Mongols had converted to Islam. Uh, so that had a significant impact uh, on all of this as well. So that covers, uh, you know, the briefly some things developing in the later Middle Ages. Um, where we're going to go now is to kind of back up a little bit uh, and and pay attention to specifically issues related to Christianity and Islam, uh, both the development of Islam as well as some things related to mission work among Muslims uh, and some other things related to uh, those efforts. And so we'll look at uh, the relationship between Christians and Islam uh, and mission work in our next session.